So welcome to the second unit in structure and operations. Um, as I indicated earlier, we'll have a, ah, <laughs> of course, that's the way to get it to rent. <laughs> hey, Don, there he is. <laughs> Hello. Hey, can you, uh, okay, let's take a five minute break. Hang on. Okay. Early Valentine's Day. Take one and pass them around. <laughs> so the same three questions we had uh, with the JL's uh, interview, the audio was a lot better on this one, so I think we finally figured that problem out. Um, but essentially, you know, something you liked, something you didn't like, or wanted to dive deeper into, and then that's one to five scale rating. Uh, on the end in terms of the effectiveness of the presentation. And I use these, as I mentioned earlier, to determine who to invite back. So, your thoughts matter on this. Again, the three questions here, chocolate's going around. Um, how many saw this sign on Friday? Friday, Saturday, Sunday? So, Roberto, did you see this? Where was it? Uh, Starbucks. Starbucks on Liberty and State had a plumbing problem. They were shut down for three days, I asked, when they finally came back. And so an interesting question is, so why would that be important to an IT manager? Sorry? <laughs> if the plumbing problem meant that there was a flood, yes, that could be a problem for the IT manager. Um, what does it underscore, though? So this whole business in this location shut down for three days. Well, what would you consider the plumbing? What's the other one? The plumbing. The okay. plumbing. Um, Sorry. Similar to an internet. Okay. Good. Yeah. What else? It's a fundamental piece of the infrastructure of the business. Right. Exactly. Roberto? I guess um, what most people don't see, but we depend a lot on like uh, the utilities of the business. Yeah, this is can be IT. Sometimes. So where is this in the iceberg? Oh, the water, oh, the water line, no pun intended, it was a plumbing problem. Um, but, um, the other thing is that this is a single point of failure. If you're an IT manager and you're looking across your IT operations, identifying possible single points of failure become important, and they may not be obvious. This is a coffee business, a coffee retail business. And I suppose if you think about it, water goes into coffee, right? But a plumbing problem shuts down the business for three days? That's a serious single point of failure. Where was the backup? In the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How would you change the sign? So, all right, you're the, you're the manager over this. How would you change the sign? Print it. <laughs> yes, right. that's one thing. You can you definitely use better fonts. Okay, right. Okay, <laughs> that's a design issue. Um, what else, though? Steven? I'd probably just say that we're close for um, infrastructure upgrade or something. You know, kind of. Yeah. Wow. Right. Which could de which could destroy the perception of the, of the organization for much longer than three days, right? Yeah. How yeah. transparent can you be, right? It doesn't then, it's how maybe have a, um, a code that you can scan on your phone <coughs> and, and get $5 off your next drink. Right, where's, where's the possible benefit or, or the we'll make it up to you part of this for the customer, yeah. right? And do IT managers need to worry about that? <coughs> If, if your customers internally are really pissed off because you've had a system outage for three days, thinking about what's called in customer service lingo, what's your recovery action? So they, Starbucks screwed up an order of mine, they gave me a, a uh, $4 card, right, free. Plus they made, remade the drink for me, right? That's a recovery action. 
it's harder in IT and harder in internal structures because to them it doesn't cost them any money. And once you do it to them once, they are like, they expect that level of service every single time. A customer coming back to you isn't gonna be able to do that. Yeah. Like, oh, we understand. We're gonna go walk down to the other server. Right. <laughs> so what an IT manager can do, though, is talk about, here's what we change so this doesn't happen again. If it does happen again, here's what we fix that we can be faster about recovery. So it's only going to be out for three hours next time instead of three days. Um, so um, <coughs> Thinking about, so the marketing side, which is actually a communication side of what you do as an IT manager matters. Um, how you're communi if, if all everybody does is run into the back room and hide, it doesn't give a really good impression to the rest of the organization that IT is on top of what's going on. Right. So it was an interesting case study. To, I actually had to, I had to, uh, uh, when I thought about this, I had to run back to the store, and I said, oh, I hope the sign is still there. <laughs> and then I went and talked to them on Monday morning, and I asked the manager, I said, how long was the sign up for? And she said, until Sunday night, I think it was, so three days. Um, I assumed it was at North Quad, because the plumbing never works here either. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 All right, Erin is up for summary. Thank you. <clears throat> Hope you all enjoyed this week's readings. I will be presenting them to you in a three by three critique. First up, the Be, be the Business readings. Um, my main takeaways were that CIOs, and it was interesting because we had our CIO interview and then the guest speaker today, and I feel like this has been echoed over and over again that uh, like the entire business strategy needs to work in line with what the IT department is doing. Um, and so that CIOs therefore have a really unique perspective of the things that are happening all over the business. Uh, another key takeaway, ship product early and often, prototype and iterate, um, and that was demonstrated from the Gates story. Um, and then have a business product owner and re rearrange teams by product for focus and deliver through small multidisciplinary teams. And I've seen that in my own professional life that when there's someone that owns a project and takes it from start to finish, it moves a lot quicker and gets a lot more um, support behind it rather than if it gets handed over and over again. Uh, sorry. This is delayed because I keep overclicking. Here are some questions for you to ponder. We will get the actual three main questions at the end. <coughs> and moving on to the Phoenix Project reading. Um, so my key takeaways from this week's readings were um, that Kanban boards can make work visible and therefore signal to up and downstream team members when they might have work expected that's coming to them. Uh, another key takeaway was that wait time is equal to the percent busy over percent idle. Ed and I had a nice conversation about this and how it's kind of a counter counterintuitive point that idle time for employees is a good thing because usually you think that you want to use things to their max productivity, but if you're doing that, then you don't leave space for like unplanned work or for things to move through it. Um, and finally, if you do not work on whatever will provide the most value to the business, then you may not be providing any <coughs> value to the business at all. This one's near and dear to me because I used to work in the compliance department, which is like uh, an expensive and time-sucking department from all other functions of the business. Uh, but it's also necessary, so it's hard to balance like your work function and also provide value, um, which I feel like is the conundrum that John has been facing, and I'm very interested to see what this meeting that they're about to have will entail. Here are some of the questions that I had. This appears to not be working any longer. 
didn't stop. Yeah, maybe the battery. Yes, he clicked it. <laughs> um, so take a minute to read the questions. Battery died. Next. Um, and then my key takeaways from the Being Geek readings. Number one was that people handle surprises in different ways. There was those fun, catchy phrases of uh, like the raging bull is probably like my favorite. I feel like it's a very descriptive way of describing someone. We all know one of them. Uh, but the, I think the important part is that knowing these things about your team members can help you manage uh, the impact of maybe like being the person that has to announce something unexpected and then being able to like wait out their initial reaction and see them as a human even after they've been a raging bull towards you. Uh, another key takeaway was practice pitching an idea before the actual reveal. Um, I think often when we're telling stories, we have all of this internal knowledge that <coughs> assume that our listener also has uh, and without kind of bouncing your story off of someone else, you may not identify the things that you're assuming that other people know, that they may not have the context to like, make the connections in a story. Uh, and then another key takeaway was pay, atten pay special attention to wait for feedback, feedback before moving <coughs> on and pace yourself during the demos. I can probably learn from that lesson right now. <laughs> and then some questions for your reflection. Always come prepared. <laughs> if you could click through the last slide, please. <coughs> cool. Uh, I'll try to. Thank you. Beautiful. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, okay, so three actual questions that we want responses to. Number one, can you think of an instance where the advice of ship product early and often would not be wise to follow? And why do you think it worked for Gates? I think it would be difficult for you to uh, revise uh, your product and fix its flaws. It's probably better to fix it before you ship it out, because otherwise you can have unhappy customers who aren't going to buy the next iteration. Uh, things like software nowadays are really easy, easy to patch and uh, you know, you can fix bugs immediately, but back in the day when you were shipping out digital <coughs> CDs, you know, it was, it was a lot more difficult, so it's impressive that it worked for Gates. I was going to say, knowing that this was, I think, like the first iteration of Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. from my understanding, like, why do you think? It wasn't easy to fix then, right? Because it wasn't like a patch that you could send. I, I, think that, I, I think the other part is early and often is that, you know, they they knew that they're coming out with an, up, with an upgrade each year, and so it's not just here's a bug fix, but here's new features and all the old bugs that we finally got around to fixing. Mm -hmm. So that way people had incentives to, they felt they're getting their money's worth, not just fixing a flawed product, but getting a new improved one. Do you have to pay for the new improved one in the model? Do you know? Uh, for if, if you're buying, you know, upgrading like uh, <coughs> Office 94 to 95, you probably have to pay for it, but. Yeah. You know, nowadays, most cats look like bug pictures are free. Someone over here. Yeah, so addressing the question, if your product addresses um, sensitive to customer base, like maybe a hospital, and you're providing them with a service, maybe uh, managing database for you know, client um, patient data, if that product fails, the ramifications of a product fails are a lot worse than a casual user software such as Instagram. So I think it really depends on who your customer bases are and how much of a customer you have. Because if you have a lot of customer, you have the potential of getting a lot of feedback that can maybe speed up the um, improvement process of your application. But if you only have really high value, small number of customers that my, this model might not work out. So what I'm hearing is like management of risk and the number of customers for each. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it really depends on like what your product is and like how sensitive it is. Like thinking about like, and also what reasons you shouldn't be, you're not ready, right? It's like Phoenix Project, 
weren't ready to shift it, and then they compromised like a bunch of people's like data, like sensitive data, and then like I watched the show Succession, and they did the same thing where they like I don't know if anyone watched it, but there's like an episode where this one character like decides to ship the product early, and that product was like a rocket ship, and even though people were like don't do it, like that's bad, um, he did it anyway because he wanted to like impress his dad, um, and it ended up like causing someone like lose an arm or something crazy. Um, and that's like dangerous, and not to say that like, and that's a crazy example, but that did also happen in real life, and it actually killed astronauts, mm -hmm. right? Is that like maybe it wasn't necessarily that they shipped the product early, but that they went ahead with the plan because like Apollo, self-deprecating, but like that's scary, right? Like if, if it's one thing, if it's like just a Windows software, but if it's like people's lives, you really have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Point. Another, like the same example with the Boeing 737 Max yeah. is, I mean, nobody wants to be like, hey, new iteration of points and less bugs on your plane. <laughs> <laughs> What's the other 80% of the bugs yeah. on my plane? Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they actually did know about the bugs ahead of time. Mm -hmm. it, it was the, uh, what was the, uh, the flight? Uh, the agency that sees. Uh, yeah, yeah. they have, they still approved yeah. it, even though internally Boeing knew how effective it was. So, well, because the FAA had changed their approach that they let the manufacturers do the inspection themselves, mm. whereas all prior all inspections had been done by the government agency. But it's a streamlining uh, effort. Uh, it was done by the so. Um, you know, I, I had forgotten, I, I didn't realize that Bill Gates had actually said that until you had pointed <coughs> it out in your slide and, and Heller had pointed it out in her book. But the, the, the rule we followed, so when I was running IT departments, was you never upgraded to Microsoft's version one. <laughs> you always waited for 1.1. And, and part of the reason was all of the bugs that you know, were in version one got fixed in 1.1. Or most of them got fixed at one point. And so the, the, the smart plan was don't roll it out to your internal users until at least version 1.1. 1 .1. That was the mindset. So that's another maybe unintended consequence of having a strategy that says, you know, ship often and fast. I think we'll move on to the second question. Yeah. What do you think of Patty's use of visible, visible project management tools, particularly the Kanban? And I'm specifically interested in knowing what you all think about uh, like remote work environments and how either this kind of visible management tool can be replicated in the remote working environment or if you think it doesn't really translate. Yeah. I think in IT, it's very useful because by nature, is, is something that you don't see or that you don't touch. So it's very easy to lose track of well, where in the project you are, uh, or even like in, in a larger um, operational scenario. And I definitely think that people working remotely can, can uh, use this. And I think we, we already have a bunch of project management tools. The problem is creating the culture to uh, processes and, and use them and on the wall. Yeah. <coughs> I remember Brielle was interning at Apple Shows and project management, and they were trying to like move into that whole like visual field, like visual Kanban's on the wall and everything like that. But the whole issue was, what are you going to do if you're working from home and then you have like a Kanban meeting and that person isn't there? And then they were trying to think of ways to kind of have one online while also having one like visually there and I was like well that kind of adds more work than just like because you have to keep them both updated and stuff like that so it kind of it's kind of interesting to see like how places are going to kind of keep the visual but still kind of keep the electronic I think it would be useful to have electronic but kind of create it visually where you can kind of project it maybe. Oh just was it last week or recently we talked about the scoreboard Different offices and across different countries, and that was really helpful in terms of 
like holding everyone accountable. It's like, all right, like I'm a VP and I need to make sure that like my developer is actually doing what he's supposed to do and I can see like every day what you're working on what you're supposed to be and like vice versa. It's like, I don't know, I think that that was really helpful and I, I feel like, especially with the way that they had it where it's like, oh, everybody's just like a free for all. And obviously I don't, I find that like physical visuals, especially today, just are like too taxing, like you mentioned, that <coughs> requires way too many iterations and it's not readily accessible for everyone. Whereas at least with like online stuff, if you delete it, you can probably get it back. Everyone can move in and see it at the same place. Um, so I did like part of it because I think that that's how they're gonna scale. It was like starting to stress me out the more they kept using like the cards and the colors. So you remember back in the, the first class, I think, where we did the uh, post-it note exercise yeah. on the wall, the, the, the dots, and I asked why is it this have? <coughs> you know, you all recognize that hearing the conversations and what people were saying about it was a part of the experience. And the advantage of, of you know, when Patty set up this board in the conference room was that people could gather around and have the conversations. But you're absolutely right, in an international organization in particular, where people are not only distributed in other locations, they may be in other time zones, how do they have that physical experience? So the way we did it was we started taking photographs and posting photographs of the, of the whiteboard. But you can flip that and say, if you're using something like Trello or Azure or whatever to, to manage your, um, your project tasks and your flow on a digital Kanban board, then why not take and project one instance of that onto the whiteboard in the conference room. Now you can gather around and still see it. You, you can't manipulate it, but you can, unless you got on the computer, but you can see it. And so is that a way to have the best of both worlds? But that, that's an important part of diversity, is that if you have diverse teams in an organization that are in different countries and in different time zones, how can you have them participate in those physical experiences like Patty's kind of board. Yeah. Adrian. It just made me think um, HoloLens 2, uh, they've got spatial computing where the idea is you're going to all be able to mm. uh, project your avatars in a single room and actually do physical manipulation of right. objects. Right, yeah, very great. I think this digital collaboration piece on things that were once um, analog or just like a you know physical manifestation to the digital is something that like you think about Microsoft or enterprise software, like Microsoft's come out with this thing called like the Surface Hub, where basically, you know, it's you know the equivalent of a combination of like computer, like large, not as big as a white, pretty big, like almost like a whiteboard, where you can move things around, you can project, you can collaborate through like teams and things like that. And I think project management tools, I think ultimately finding that way to make a like, representation of that, I think is important so that you can have that interaction between the digital and the physical. But, it, but I will say it's one of the nice things of like a physical Kanban board, if it's um, not digital, is that it's simple and like you can implement it faster than, now there are a lot of free tools, but um, I think the like over, there's also the fear of over designing something um, if you were trying to build it from scratch. I think whoever made the comments on like the culture of the use is really important too. I think the, Lots of places try to slap on like a Slack or a Trello or you know whatever tool they think is right at the time. But unless you have buy-in from like everyone on the team or a way to enforce it, then it's probably just going to end up being something that. Yeah, actually, at uh, my work, um, a couple of years ago, somebody tried to implement a new um, project management tool. Everybody ignored that. <laughs> And we had like weekly meetings about getting familiar with the tool and how to use it. And all I heard was questions and, and why not. Um, and then nobody realized that we already had one for, for the other tool that we used, the other database that we used, and it had an embedded um, um, project management tool, and nobody knew about it. Right. So that tells you a lot about the culture of following these type. Right, and if the tool is supposed to be making you do your work more efficiently, but it's taking lots of like training and time on people who want to stay, like, they really have to see the value in order for it to benefit. Right. We'll move on to the final question. Do you have any strategies for controlling your own <coughs> knee jerks, the raging bulls out there? Or do you agree with the book that the immediate reaction isn't important, but the long term? 
So just a reminder, in the Being Geek book, they're talking about the different ways that people react to surprises um, and how that is not necessarily as important as the way that they react to them shortly after they've kind of like cooled their jets. So what are your thoughts? Yes. So uh, with years of working with developers, I've learned pretty quickly that you not immediately get mad at them or blame them for a problem. It's always better to just work towards the solution with them while, you know, um, not trying to assign blame at the time. Because especially if there's like a major incident or something, you're going to have to go through probably some sort of meeting with <coughs> someone else that's going to be yelling at everyone you know, on the table. So you can, um, if you're a unified front, it seems to always be the best method of just getting to the end result, which is either fixing the issue or getting a uh, project done or anything like that. So um, for, for my own roles, I've had to kind of just shut down any sort of emotional reaction to things and always just think logically and try to move uh, in, in the right direction. So uh, I let other people be emotional. <laughs> So what you're saying is you're the calm river or whatever that one was? <laughs> you have to be, yeah. <laughs> and then you give the developers something constructive. <laughs> Any final comments? I'm going to come back to this because I have a little exercise for us to do on it, which um, your s slide deck uh, inspired me from for. Uh, thank you very much. Good job. Okay. Um, we just did the top questions, that's why I skipped over that quickly. So this chart appears in on page in chapter 23, rather, of the Phoenix Project, and this notion that as you get closer to full utilization, your wait time goes way up, and that ends up being a pretty important discovery that they made uh, in the Phoenix Project, and it's also an important one uh, that was first developed in the manufacturing realm, but also can be applied to, to IT. Um, uh, Tom DeMarco, one of uh, the, the early systems analysis heroes uh, the, that I read and studied with, um, you know, talked about the importance, so he wrote a book called Slack, the importance of Slack time. Um, and so the thing that they're realizing is that the busier Brent gets, the more waiting there is, and the more things slow down. And so that's the counterintuitive part, that you have to, as a manager, you have to build into the schedule slack time. It's, it's more than contingency time, you know, that if something goes wrong. But it's basically saying that if we're going to be optimal about the key points in our development, in this case, Brent, we have to make sure that Brent <coughs> isn't totally swamped or it's a particular part, particular project team that working on that they're not totally swamped because then things start to grind down to a halt. Um, here's the exercise I was talking about. So here's the, the eight things that uh, knee jerks that, that Lop uh, mentions. And I thought it might be fun to do this on the board. <coughs> <coughs> Who's the Dr. No in Phoenix? Steve. Sorry? Steve, okay. Any other thoughts? John. John? Yeah, John's John's sort of the doom and gloom, right? Sarah. Sarah. Oh, maybe. Let's see how the others fall out, and we may want to move some of these around. All right. Uh, Aaron's favorite, the raging bull. Who's the raging bull? <laughs> Who else? Bill might be a raging bull too. He gets pretty mad. He quits. He quits. <laughs> well, that's one of the ones on here, right? <laughs> so look, let's let's press on. Still water. Who's the still water for? Patty. Patty. Yeah. Ooh. Patty. Eric is still in water. Ah, yeah. Good. How about the distiller? So who's doing that a lot? 
Actually, it's somebody who keeps asking Bill. Eric. Eric, yeah. Now, Eric, but then he's asking Bill to take it in, right? So there's a, there's a <coughs> distilling relationship there. What about the handler? I think Patty's the handler. I can't imagine them making any promise without her. <laughs> she, she is the anchor person, I think, on that too. Um, the my bad. Who's taking? Who always says it's well, it's my fault? Uh, Bill. We're doomed. John, John, John. <laughs> yeah. Maybe West too. Yeah. Well, Chris. Ah, <coughs> yeah. Where do you think Chris is in here? Sorry. <coughs> What's Chris's initial reaction to things? Far-fetched, you know, where Lop is talking about these is, is initial patterns of response, and you probably have seen this uh, with people either on your teams that you've had so far here at the at the university, but also in your internships. And if you haven't, you will. <laughs> these things come up. Um, and who who is the one who seems to handle? Well, that's the handler, right? That seems to handle all these others. We put Patty and Chris as sort of handlers. Is, is Patty sort of, the, you know, the, is she the, the peacemaker we can move forward type person? Yeah. Or somebody else? I feel like we're reading this story from Bill's perspective, so it seems like it's Bill, but I don't know if that's mm -hmm. only because he's the narrator. Ah, and is Bill to some degree, because Bill is the manager, right. is he being forced to be a handler in that sense? And so a really interesting question, is does the manager need to be a handler? But I think no. the point the books make that the books make the book makes uh, is that it doesn't necessarily matter what the initial reaction is so much as right. the like long term reaction. Right. So whether or not a manager is a handler initially, I think is less important than if they collect themselves and become, but I don't think they can be like one of the mean ones, you know. Yeah. No one likes to work for that person. So there was a, um, um, a return desk at one of the department stores, and one of the uh, uh, customer service agents had to staff the desk. And somebody came in, they brought back their like a, a toaster that makes toast, right? <coughs> and they, they screamed, saying, this thing doesn't work, and threw it at the wall over the, over the customer service rep's head, you know, boom, and it shattered on the wall. <coughs> and the customer service rep stopped for a minute and said, I'll tell you what, I'll go talk to the manager, we'll get you a replacement unit while you figure out what to do for an next act. <laughs> and use humor to diffuse the situation of Chris. I don't know whether that worked, worked in that case. Who did? And also, if you're a manager, I think it's really important to consider what your pri priorities are. Because honestly, not all managers <coughs> only think about the company's survival or success. They also think about success of his team and yep. well-being of his team. So if he knows 
that by fighting this unreasonable request, that way I can protect my team members. It might be conflicting with the interests of the company. Yeah, to some degrees, managers have to run what's called interference. <coughs> you know, provide some protection and some insulation from senior managers, from you know, others in the organization. Um, and we already read in Lop's book about you know, the manager having to play that role of, uh, of counselor. You know, you're going to have people dropping in your <coughs> office and you're, you're going to not only be hearing about work issues, you're going to be hearing about personal issues and, uh, and time off issues and the like, and you have to be able to handle or deal with all of those. Plus you have to worry about, is our project moving forward? and I'm being successful with it. So um, these at first are entertaining types of categories, but as a, as a manager, IT department or any department, you have to have some skill in dealing with those. So we'll, learn, we'll see more about how these develop uh, towards the final chapters uh, in the Phoenix area. Um, just to quickly say that, you know, we all know we're in this middle part here, instruction and operations. Projects and processes are the key things we want to talk about today. Um, and in Phoenix, this is getting a little, little busy uh, now, but uh, the statement that I put for this section, which we read for this week, was Eric's question, what's the biggest risk? Do you remember the answer to that question? For Phoenix, for uh, Parts Unlimited, what's the biggest risk? Going out of business. Going out of business, exactly. <coughs> Who does he say that to? To John. To John. He's saying to John, you're so worried about, it. Well, John says, well, I'm living in a cesspool of risks, I think is the line that he uses. And Eric says, what's the, the biggest risk? Is the organization goes out of business. And says that, that if you take a holistic view of the organization, you're going to take into account what's going to help the organization thrive or fail. <coughs> you can't ignore security, but the question that gets asked of John is, where have you added value? Um, and you know, Bill ends up meeting him at the bar and, and giving him that tough love question. In the last three, four years, or however long John has been there, have you added any value? That's a tough question to hear. Eric? For argument's sake, to Eric's point, is that not a selfish perspective? Like, wouldn't the biggest res risk being like compromising tons of people's personal financial information? <laughs> well, if that causes the company to go out of business, one could argue <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's these things are related. Yes, um, but if you had the most secure data but the organization was failing to deliver products, increase revenue from customers, and control expenses, the organization's probably gonna go out of business. And in that case, being the most secure in every way possible didn't matter. You know, it's a, so it's an, it's an important, um, I don't want to say balancing act, but it's an important consideration to look at both sides of that. And that's what Eric is being rather pointed about getting John to do. Now John, John has a change of heart, you'll see as the chapters unfold, where he finally figures this out and figures out how to make a contribution to the business and still, um, still have concerns about security, concerns about the audit in particular. Um, so the key question is, so how do we balance this process, there's the word balance, process and speed, quality, efficiency, and managing <coughs> projects and IT flow. <coughs> Kanban is all about IT flow, and this is that, that first way. So there are, there are the four types of work that we've studied so far in the Phoenix Project and the three ways. This comes out of lean manufacturing, it's being applied uh, to IT here. Um, and this first way is fast flow, and also has to do with uh, slack time and, and working in progress. Uh, we've already been introduced to all of these concepts. They'll come back again with different emphasis as we continue in the book. Um, 
And oh, the last part, these are the wing principles that underline DevOps, underlie rather DevOps, which is what we're reading about in the Phoenix Project. So Monta Heller wrote another book, her first book, which actually is a, is a really um, a delightful uh, uh, book uh, that, that I enjoyed. Um, and she talks about this paradox. She has a little poster with these paradoxes listed on one sheet of paper and said, as, as, as the, so as the head of IT, you were hired to be strategic, but you're forced to spend most of your time on operational issues. And you were the steward, you were the steward of risk mitigation and cost containment, yet you're expected to innovate. And when you innovate, as Zuckerberg would say, you've got to break things, right? So the paradox is not that you have to pick a midway point, but you have to embrace both. Um, if you're a CIO that just worries about risk mitigation, which is what John's perspective is, where's the innovation going to come from? Because innovation is about taking risks. Right? And if all you do is worry about having to be operationally efficient, where does the IT strategy come from? And vice versa, if you have a great IT strategy, <clears throat> but you don't implement, that, that's that other quote that, uh, that Don picked up on. That you know, if you can't master the tactical, you can't execute strategic. Uh, business processes. Who has eaten bow dumplings? <laughs> All right, you know, one. <laughs> have you eaten a deep den tai fung? You have eaten a deep den fung. Okay, <laughs> so I've eaten that four different den tai fungs in two in two in Taipei, one in Seoul, and one in Los Angeles. Um, and every time you go in, you can see them here, they're, they're make, watch them making the dumplings. So I'd like to watch this video clip, but what I'd like you to pay attention to is what's the process they use for making these dumplings. So these dumplings are, are um, they're sort of magical because when they're steamed, the inside turns to soup. And then you, you have to be careful how it's hot. You have to be careful how you break them and eat them. But the, it's an incredibly tasty soup inside of the, the dumpling skin. Um, so let's watch the video. Together as a digital moment, collectively it means um, the best dumplings that will create good abundance. Yeah, there's always a risk showing this video in our dinner time, <laughs> and they are that good. Um, but we're talking about processes, and we're using this to introduce process. What did you notice about what are what are the steps involved in this and the measures? Do you remember some of the measures that were meant said? All right, right. So, but before they even measure the, the dough, right? What's the thing they do before that? Six months of training. <laughs> Six months of training, okay, that's the people side. But in the, in, the, in the ingredient side, the first thing they have to do is make the dough. I think they were showing mixing it you know, near the beginning. And then after making the dough, then, then you, you had the right thing. You cut into five gram cubes. Then what? Then roll them out to be thin. Roll them out, right? What did you say? Roll. You say roll. Okay. Roll. Um, and remember, what did he say about rolling the dough? There was a standard thickness and size, right? And then after rolling the dough, filling, right? How much filling? <coughs> 16 grams. We made it a point of saying that the total is 21 grams. <laughs> that's that's a stand that's a standard you're talking about, right? And then then what comes that to have you filling? Folding. How many bowls? 18. Then what? Steaming. Steaming. Didn't tell us how long they steamed it. Yeah. <laughs> That's one more interesting. 
Yes. Probably different for each type of building. Yeah. Now this is this is making. Now he goes through a whole set of steps for eating. <laughs> What's the eating process? So this is this is the making process. What's the eating process? First thing you do? Put it in the spoon. <laughs> you put it in the spoon. Then break the dough. And they're hot. When you break the dough, it, it steams out. What next? Let it cool the soup. Yeah, let it cool. Being there, so. You gotta blow on it. <laughs> All right. So we have a cool pause in here. Right? All right. We got a cool pause in there. All right. Then you drink the soup, right? Then what? Garnish. 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 Two pieces of dinner. Two pieces of dinner, right? And what was the other one? Young ginger, not the old one. Ah, young ginger, very important. And what was the other thing? They have to be soaked in the soy, soy right? Mm -hmm. Ginger. Is it soy and vinegar or just soy? Soy and vinegar? You think both? Just soy? Or just vinegar, not soy? I think it depends on like, like your preference. Ah, okay. He didn't seem to think so. <laughs> it was like, you need to eat it this way, right? <laughs> and then what we could do here is we could say, okay, this is a loop. <laughs> you know, we could go back and then tell you. you know, we didn't eat the dumpling. Yeah, we didn't eat the One bite. Oh. One bite. Oh, sorry. Eat the dumpling. One bite. I'm oh, sorry. That's right. He was very clear about that, right? And it's one a, bite. We put a wild steak in the pot. A which? A wild, wild statement, yes. <laughs> when we're hungry. <laughs> wild um, steamer. That's not the technical not term. While steamer is not empty, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then after this one is done, <laughs> you go back over here. Because after you have one serving and they just say, well, we need to order another one you know, of these as well, it'll only take a while. The reason I belabor this is, is, well, not because it's just that it's fun, but when you're in IT and the IT manager, one of the things you, that you're asked to understand is the business process. You've probably heard this term used a lot. But before you go to the technical steps, you need to understand the business process. And the business processes are the steps it takes to accomplish an objective or a goal. It may be to issue a bill, or issue a contract, <coughs> or receive money from the customer. Each one of these things has a process. You're probably very familiar with this on, on websites. If you buy something on a website, right, first thing you do is you, you look at the various products, then what? Yes. Put them where? Oh, I said I was going to read the reviews. You read the reviews? Okay. You can say, yeah, just have to read the reviews. Good. good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> eventually, it goes into a shopping cart. And eventually, then you go to the shopping cart and you say, how are you going to pay for it? Where is it going to be shipped to? All of that. And then you, you buy. Right? We have to indicate, is it a gift or not? Right? And then you indicate. So each, each of that, that process of buying something online has a number of business steps. Then the, those of you who design the web processes have to understand, sometimes we call these use cases, but you have to understand the steps of the business process and what other business processes might be represented by that <coughs> online organization, like returning an item, what the steps to go through you know, on that as well. Um, and one of the rules is first look to streamline the business process before you write the system. Otherwise, you run the risk of what Michael Hammer calls paving the cow path. If you have an old way of doing something in an organization and all you do is automate it, you're paving the cow path. You're making 
technical or adding technology on an old process before you're even asking, is there a better way to do this process? Now, I have a handout. This folder. So the book that I used frequently in re-engineering business processes before we would do IT projects is uh, this <coughs> one of these, this book by Johansson. <coughs> and this is a flow chart from at and the phone company that, that John uh, Proctor mentioned in his, his talk. And this is about a contract process. Let me just get back to the, to the slide. And just to summarize what we've been talking, this, this business about um, processes. Is it as inputs? So we had dough, and before that we had eggs and things to make as inputs here. And we have resources, and then we have outputs. And most business processes, you can follow this basic called input process output model. And if you look at that, the starting of this workflow here is, you know, prepared, so this is a contract process, preparing the renewal package that starts up on the top left. And then um, this actually continues on for a couple more pages after this, but these are the steps that it's going through in order to get to this, um, to this end state. And the business process reengineering says, which of these steps can we eliminate? Which are duplicate or unnecessary? And can we take out of this? Or can we stream simplify you know, some of these that are in the, the gray shaded? Um, and, um, and then the upper ones in the upper left is the elimination of the renewal process uh, itself. So, <coughs> If lean IT is the extension of lean manufacturing, then um, one of the considerations is that when we apply it to IT, it's the elimination of waste. If we apply it to business processes, it's the elimination of waste. Where waste is work that adds no value. So um, one of the questions we would ask in the business process re-engineering exercises is we would ask the teams of employees would we go out of business if we eliminated this step? Or ask the why, why is this step here? Well, we've always done this step. That's, that's the most common answer. Um, what would happen if we didn't do that step? Because one of the realizations is that steps in a process cost money. This whole process costs <coughs> people time to execute. You have to pay people salaries to execute it. And therefore, if you break it down by step or by box, each box is worth something. And so taking those out saves money in the organization. And you want to do that first before you write the system. So a question you can ask as system designers or as IT project managers is, is have we streamlined the business process? Have we examined that first? What did it look like before? <clears throat> so again, this is a typical contract process and then re-engineering attempts to simplify steps by taking out uh, boxes before then the system work is done. So any questions about process management first before I jump into project management, Roberto? So back to this uh, thing, is that what a business analyst do? Mm -hmm. so? But do you see why it's important for the technology people to understand this also? Um, <coughs> you normally have the visibility of all this. Or like, I mean, if you have a, a, a business analyst. <laughs> Oftentimes the business analyst works in the IT department, but in Martha Heller is talking about this, the advantage of a CIO is having that end-to-end -end visibility. <clears throat> how the business runs. Yeah, but if you have like different managers, yeah, 
and each manager can be a silo. That's a problem. From a boat. How, how yeah. do you get the, the whole? That, that, that's a problem because um, the people who do the technical work may have insights that would be important to the business process discussion in terms of, well, you, you know, we have some choices here. We could go this way or that way. What would that mean for the business process? And so by, by having the silos, you miss the opportunity for that dialogue to happen. And that's a risk in an organization. And we'll see evidence of this building up in Phoenix where the conversations that are gonna happen around the table become all that important. And one of the things as an IT manager that may be, um, uh, takes a while to, to realize is that you're a manager of conversations. The conversation is the fundamental building block of IT management. You have to understand how the business runs. You have to understand how the business process works. You have to have a dialogue with the business owners about how that might change be re-engineered or with the business analysts. And then at the end of the day, you may say, you know what? There's this off-the-shelf system that already does 90% of it. Why are we going to build this? Who makes that recommendation? So the conversation about all of those pieces ends up being rather important. And why is it important? Look at this. 34% of, of IT projects are, are, uh, are successful. 15% are outright crash and burn. 51% are challenged with cost overruns or time overruns. This was the Standish Chaos Report that was first released in 2003. And you may say, OK, well, that's, that's almost 20 years old. That can't be the story today. Yes, Erin. Can you explain what the first part Unqualified IT project success is usually means it's on time and on budget and, and met its objectives in terms of delivering um, the deliverables of the project, the scope of the project was, was delivered, it was met. So scope, remember we talked about, and we, I think we talked about scope and time and quality and um, uh, cost. So scope, time, and cost, those three end up being rather important in IT projects. If all of those are met, it's considered an unqualified <coughs> success. If you cut the scope from what was originally intended, you may deliver the project on time and on budget, but is it meeting the needs of the, the people? Probably not at all of the needs. Um, so I was leading up to the, so this is 2003 when they, they first did this, but here's the data for the five years ending 2015, which was the latest report I, I could find. Um, and the numbers are not really improving. Um, I am, I'm reading a book now called The Dreaming in Code. And one of the things that the author is doing is, is reviewing some of the major project failures and saying that if our development program development teams knew about these types of records, would you even start? And they said, oh, wait, well, wait, it will be different this time. And unfortunately, statistics show that that's something that almost every year a project team says will be different. Um, and so as an I IT manager, now this is large projects that they're, that they're examining. So as IT manager, you, you want to think twice, you want to think three times about do you want to undertake a big IT project? Because the numbers are not with you. Would you bet on those odds? Would you bet your salary on those odds? Or your position on those odds? Now we'll talk about a little bit more about what you can do. But first I want just to, to sink in is that the failure history is fairly dramatic with IT projects. <coughs> now it ends up there's um, I like Doug DeCarlo with this wonderful book called Extreme Project Management. He's applying the first agile type group was extreme programming. And he's applying those concepts that Ken Beck developed into project management itself. And he says, you know, there are two mindsets. He calls them the Newtonian mindset and the quantum mindset. And the Newtonian mindset says, you know, stability is a norm. 
And the quantum mindset says, no, chaos is the norm. Um, Newtonian says, well, the world is predictable, it's controllable, we can minimize the change, um, <coughs> et cetera. And the quantum mindset says, well, uncertainty rules, Murphy's law, which means that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong rules. Um, we should welcome change. We should relax the controls to increase the feeling of security. You can see where this mindset is represented even within uh, Bill Palmer's team. Um, now, this doesn't end up needing to be an either or problem. Um, other way, another, just a, one more slide of this uh, division. So my job as a project manager, the Newtonian mindset would say to deliver the planned project results. The quantum person would say to deliver the desired results. The best way to do this, you just plan to drive the results use results to drive the plan. My preferred approach is to aim, aim, I'd say aim, fire. <laughs> and the quantum person says, fire, then redirect the bullet. So the notion of agile small sprints, for example, fits you know, in this one here. And the traditional waterfall model tends to fit more on the left. So if you're wearing a Newtonian hat, and a Newtonian compass to navigate your way through a quantum world. So you're working in Silicon Valley, for example. You're most likely you're going to feel very frustrated, under stress most of the time, and you'll, su you'll suffer from what he calls Newtonian neurosis. This may be part of John's issue, what he's going through uh, in Phoenix. Um, and a question to ask is you. Uh, the different organizations that you experience, whether through projects, whether through internships, or through your jobs and career, um, is to ask that question, well, what type of organization is yours? Um, and it may differ even within the same organization, depending on, on each group. Now, the key, probably the key takeaway that I'd like you to have on project management is that and from an IT management perspective, you're managing three things. We're taking quality in the center as a given. But you're managing scope, cost, schedule, or time. Right? And the rule here is that the client can only define two of these. The project team gets the third. And I learned this from an architect uh, who was working on a project that I was on the, on the design committee for. Um, and he was building a community center, this is in Greenwich, Connecticut. And he said, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the town wanted to control all three things. They wanted to control the cost, they wanted to control the city. They basically said, it can't spend more than this amount of money, it's got to be done in this amount of time, and you need to include all of these features. Right? And his message was, that's not possible. You can only control two, you've got to give me the third as the architect. And so when I heard that story, I said, well, you know, that's pretty true of IT project teams, and that's been my experience uh, over the years, is the client can only demand two. And so the question is, which two? And it ends up that um, the one that the project management team in IT typically has the most control over is scope. And the way you can control scope is by having phases or as products that we talked about earlier have is releases. If there's a release one or a release two or a release three, by the time you get to release three, you probably have a fairly broad scope that was originally conceived. But you're delivering things on a regular basis. You're delivering things you know, typically within budget. And so you want to push out into future releases, future phases, part of the scope. So there are a number of ways to manage projects. We've already talked about you know, waterfall, which if you imagine a waterfall going down a series of falls, you, know, you start with analysis and you have design and you, know, you, you build the code and you have the testing and the rollout and, you know, and a probably a documentation in there somewhere as well. Um, and it follows a fairly orderly process. The problem is you can't go back and adjust things you know, after you learn more through the process. And then the, these agile approaches, or agile is listed there, 
the notion is that you, you are iterating and learning things as you go, and therefore adjusting your design as you go. Um, and the Agile Manifesto, uh, which was written in 2001, and in the notes section here, I, I've also put a link to an article that was done in the Atlantic about the history of the Agile movement, and the original um, uh, offsite, called it an offsite, they went to Snow, Snowbird in Utah, a ski resort, and a group of, uh, of the people that were developing this sort of Agile approach came up with the Agile Manifesto, and they put it available on a website and uh, for people to sign, <coughs> and the different alternatives you can read about uh, on Wikipedia actually has a pretty good page on project management. Um, now, the Agile Manifesto, it's rather amazing. There are four things in the Agile Manifesto. And it's basically through the work, through the learning, we've, we have learned to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We've learned to value working software over comprehensive documentation. Interesting contrast. Customer collaboration is valued over contract negotiation, and responding to change is valued over following a plan. Sounds quantum in, in De Carlo's words, uh, and in fact, De Carlo's book came after uh, the Agile Manifesto. Um, and then the statement at the end of the manifesto that says that uh, while there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. And that was a distinct revolution that happened in software development and in IT project management um, at the near the turn of the century. And over 20,000 people, they closed the signatures. You can't sign it anymore. But, but and, uh, when they did, it was about 20,000 signatures uh, that people. So it actually became, it was a movement at the right time. Uh, people. Uh, went on, read the manifesto, and said, yeah, I agree with that, I think that's the way we should go, and signed their name to it. Uh, you can actually go on the website and click on the various years and read all of the different people uh, that, that signed it. <coughs> now, this diagram was one that I've used often in, in, in talking about project <coughs> management over the years. Um, and these two dimensions uh, sort of follow the discussion that, that we've had so far. There are the more heavyweight examples on the left-hand side, and the Agile people often refer to the heavyweight and the lightweight uh, types of approaches. Um, that's one axis, that's the, that's the x-axis here. The y-axis is having very participative, typically with the customer, with the business people, um, very high collaboration versus very procedural, regimented, and low collaboration at the bottom. The waterfall tends to be towards the, the lower left and extreme programming uh, towards the upper right. Um, so the key question for all of us, if we're studying IT management, is, well, how does an IT manager choose? Um, if it's a bridge, or a jumbo jet, or an Iowa caucus, <laughs> so, um, which would you choose? Um, one of the things we learned from the Iowa caucus case was that if you operate under the assumption that I can do multiple releases, I have a long software adoption timeline, then releasing something early, as Bill Gates said, <laughs> sooner and early, right and often, um, <clears throat> is the wrong assumption because the Iowa caucus had an operation window of one night. A missile that's fired, the Saturn V rocket that was one of the most successful uh, rockets in history that was behind the moon uh, flights, um, fires once. And the hundreds of thousands of systems that are in it only get to operate once. Um, and it has to happen within minutes from launch to when uh, the upper stages are put, put into orbit and eventually sent off to the moon. Um, building a bridge. Building a bridge has a longer time horizon for development. But if a bridge was built in an iterative fashion, <coughs> would you drive across it? 
you know. And so one of the things to realize here, I think, from this is that um, if the risk is higher, you probably want to use a more regimented process, not an iterative process. If the risk is lower, you can do five releases. Nobody's going to go out of business. Then you can probably use things in the upper right. The other is unknowns. So when you're building a bridge, everything is probably known, right? You know how many cars it has to carry and trucks it has to carry and how far the span is and how far over above the water is it going to be. All these things are known and can be specified and put in as the requirements. In most software systems, though, there are many unknowns that you have to discover as you go, which lend themselves more to iterative types of processes. So the question you're asking as an IT manager is what kind of project am I dealing with? And what are the levels of risk? What are the levels of known or unknown? Uh, one of the ways we look at this in crisis <coughs> informatics is uh, hurricane maps. And hurricanes have this what's called the cone of uncertainty. That when the hurricane starts to form here, this is the probability of its path. So it could be up here or it could be down there. And as, the, as you get closer to the end of the hurricane, you know more. And that variability may be less. And it's a good pictorial representation, a good case representation of uncertainty. Now, Barry Bohm did this diagram. Barry Bohm was probably one of the fathers of software engineering, worked at the Department of Defense in the US, wrote a very important book on systems engineering, talks about <coughs> this variability from the initial project definition to when the software is finally accepted by the customers is that's constantly being narrowed as you go through. So that's, this is a cone of software development. Um, <coughs> and one of the points he makes that the Agile movement also, and extreme programming rec recognizes as well, is don't make your commitments too early um, when the uncertainties are highest. much more reliable commitments when you're further down uh, the development cone. Uh, Kent Beck in his book, Extreme Programming, which is one of the, the key documents in, in project management, program management, um, you know, basically says that if, the, you know, this is the assumption, is that the cost of change goes up dramatically with each stage of the project. And by the time you get near the end of the project production, changing something gets really costly. And he said, well, but what if, what if the cost sort of levels off earlier, you know, and, and, and it less dramatic arise over time, then you'd postpone, you know, you'd postpone freezing the system until late <coughs> in the process. So that's another consideration as well. Um, and I, I highly recommend his book on this, even though now it's 20 years old. It's, I think it still rings true uh, in terms of what he was doing. We had a um, project management review board at the uh, International Red Cross, <coughs> and we came up with 20 reasons, uh, 10 reasons rather, why um, project management, having a project management methodology and approach was important in the organization. These were the top four uh, having to do with quality projects. Um, projects that integrate well with the system, with the other systems that we had in-house, to be able to pass audits, avoid duplicate costs, um, et cetera. And all of this was expensive and times continuing to add after the fact. So thinking about the project management in advance was important. So we were trying to, uh, and we succeeded in having uh, the Red Cross adopt a, a more purposeful project management approach. Yes. Uh, will you be speaking about system audits at some point? System audits. Um, I'll, I'll be actually talking about organizational audits. Okay, well, your three si point mentions system audits. In the uh, bone okay. chart? No. Oh, that Go back. Yeah. No, forward. 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 I think three of your top.
top four, four of the top ten? In the next one. Yeah, so that's just ah. about it. Yes, so I'm going to be talking about audits in general of which system IT audits are a part. We did do separate IT audits, but they tended to be uh, more what were called penetration tests. Um, how vulnerable were our systems, the hacking, and things like that. And we have an outside company attempt to break into our systems, and, and they did, and gave us reports on how, how they did it. How they found it. They even did something they called they we call it dumpster diving. They even pulled old reports out of a garbage dumpster, and figured out some things from that. They walked around the office and noticed that people had sticky notes on the machines with passwords and things like that. So um, penetration tests can be a, a rather enlightening uh, type of event. But I'll talk more in the context of, of uh, organization audits, which is what you see in the Phoenix project. There's an audit committee of the board. They produced an audit report with an outside audit company, and a number of findings on that audit have to do with IT. And that's typically the way it happens in an organization. So we were given a set of audit findings in the IT department that were part of the, the larger annual financial audit, and then we had to address those or say what we could do. And yes, I will talk a lot about that in actually in the lecture. Um, so I, I, one of the questions that I, I said, asked before was how do we do this as a project manager in terms of managing scope? And one of the things we did at Save the Children um, was that as we discussed this particular project, which was automating the child sponsorship uh, program that Save the Children has, our list became longer and longer and longer. Um, and so what we started to do was something that uh, Kent Beck actually <coughs> introduced uh, in extreme programming was each need or each idea that came up in those discussions, in those conversations, we wrote on a card, an index card, like the one you just filled out earlier on Don Proctor. Um, and then we constantly went back to the business side and we would ask them to sort the deck. Put it you know, in the order of the top priority at the top of the deck and the lowest priority at the bottom of the deck. And as we had more discussions and we added more cards, we would then have a, a, a sorting exercise and ask them you know, to, to resort those. And then what we could do is we could cut the deck. We could say, OK, if we need to have a release of this product in three months, then we've estimated that we can do this many cards. We'll take those out of the deck. We're doing that in the next release. We're not losing any of these other cards, but that's going to be in the next phase or in the next release. And then after we'd learned some things from the first release and the customers internal and external would experience things in the first release, they would come back with more ideas and, and add to the list of things. And then we'd sort them again. We didn't sort them in the IT department. We brought them to the business side and asked them to sort it. So the Iron Triangle um, saying, I said earlier that the uh, the IT department most often managed scope. Uh, creating and sorting these story cards is a method of uh, managing scope. Um, and I already talked about its, its background in extreme programming. Um, and this was, again, a very physical exercise. So similar to, a, you can do this on a Kanban board. And actually, they're doing a version of this in Phoenix with actually putting, taping them up on the board. Um, but we did it with a deck that we would then sort. Um, and then the next thing that you can uh, also do is what's called time boxing. So for time boxing, you fix the time when the next release is going to come out. You may vary the scope. Uh, because the problem we had, when I worked for Lotus um, before they were bought by IBM, uh, and their spreadsheet was the largest selling spreadsheet. It, it actually drove the IBM PC success. In the, in the 1980s, and then Excel ended up rising up uh, from Microsoft and, and beating it later. Uh, but the first major <coughs> upgrade for 123 was over a year delayed, and the scope kept growing. And customer expectations, you know, about when am I going to get that feature or when am I going to get that fix, uh, were not being met. And so we changed the approach to say that we're going to have a minor release every quarter and a major release every year. 
<coughs> and in the project management, we would, we would cut the deck of feature cards and say, this is what's going to make the quarterly, this is what's going to make the next quarterly, this is what's going to make the annual. But the advantage is some value got delivered to customers on a regular basis, and so it made the customers happy, and it was easy for customers to plan. You know, when, when were these things coming uh, down the pike? And that's called time boxing. <coughs> it also recognizes, and I love this quote by Adam Savage of Mythbusters, uh, about the power of the deadline. And you all know this as students really well. Right? Is that the closer the deadline gets, the more likely you're going to start thinking way outside the box, you know, get it done, you know, type of thing, right? And the more often, more likely you are to simplify it, to get it done. And so deadlines, if you have a project management IT operation that's doing quarterly releases and annual major releases, you can almost chart the productivity as, you know, spiking up before the end of each quarter as it goes through, and overall, you get more productivity out of the ent entire <coughs> year. Um, you're all controlled, in a sense, and I don't want to use the word control, you'll, you'll <laughs> march towards uh, the semester system, right? Ultimately, you have to get things done by the end of the semester, and you might have to get things done before midterm, you know, midway, but, and then you have to get things done ultimately before graduation, so you're constantly managing the deadline. Um, if you're an IT manager, or if you're any, actually if you're managing anything in an organization, um, deadlines become one of your key friends, your key tools for getting things done. Um, defining a deadline, and then breaking things that are too big into smaller parts, and smaller deadlines is, a, is another technique. So in conclusion, um, Projects and processes, they're the building blocks of the IT manager. They're the building blocks of strategy and operations, and they're also accomplished with people and their conversations, and also the customers uh, of your organization. <coughs> Questions? That was a rapid tour from a manager's perspective on project management. It was not intended in any way to teach you project management. That's something I expect you going to learn in other environments. All right, let's take a break. <coughs> um, we don't have enough time to do the uh, the both of the video exercises, so I'm going to make it a, a simple take home of there's just some, some questions that you can ask with your teams. Um, but let's just, I'll just watch the three minutes, three, four minutes. Uh, this is uh, Yves Moreau, and uh, he is a um, partner at Boston Consulting Group, um, and his mantra is talking about simplicity. Um, and one of the things that you, um, you often are faced with, uh, particularly in, in IT management, is how do I remove complexity and have more simplicity uh, in the work in my department? So he has this wonderful example of the, uh, the women's relay team in, in one of the world championships. Um, so let's just watch that and, and, uh, and uh, to whet your appetite for the, the table <laughs> questions. Okay, I'll let you watch that um, at your leisure. Um, but he goes in the first video he talks about his rules of simplicity, and in this one he talks about the, the power of the interfaces um, and the role that that plays, particularly in, in team effort. It's the handoffs. Um, so that in project management, if you're working with business analysts, you're working with business people, and then you're developing things that could be tested or demoed uh, by business people or, or by customers, at each of those steps you're doing handoffs. And how are you, according to Eve's approach to this, how are you making it possible for the next person to do better than they normally would? And so the 
the power of the interfaces is, is an important <coughs> thing uh, to keep in mind. It also means that, you know, thinking in terms of job description, like uh, my job is to do this, and when I'm done, I stop. And what Eves is saying is that's what drops the baton, you know, and controls, you know, between. Instead of saying, if your goal is to make the next person faster, then the handoffs matter. And thinking through how you're doing the handoffs and project management. So these are I'll, I'll send these around as a um, uh, as a as a take home. Um, uh, everybody shows an ment uh, has chosen a mentor. That's a definite statement. And everybody has a scenario. Right? Did I get these right? Um, I will point out one observation from this. Three teams have chosen scenario three. We're going to randomly pick who goes first in presentation order. Um, but do you think the third team that has three is going to benefit from the other two? Because you'll all see your presentations in the practice presentations also. And so um, you might want to think about defining, you can still stick with scenario three. I'm not saying you should change that. But you might want to change the context or change an aspect of it. You can talk to your mentor about that. In general, in a whole series of presentations, the most memorable are the first and the last. Okay, so when you've got three presentations that are on the same topic, <laughs> you need to think about that. So the so challenge for you is how do I make it different? Okay, we'll talk to your mentor about that. Um, these you already know about the scenarios. Next step, so um, I have another handout. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I realize that um, we were not clear as, as we could be about how assignments build. <coughs> um, and so in the handouts coming around, you'll see that there are tracks that are defined. And there's a, these are the basic units of the class. We have a strategy track that we finished. We're in the operations track now, and then we'll be doing staffing. I group them together here. Um, and then the senior management team, this is team projects. And these are the various assignments that build on top of each other to get you to the goal, which is in red on these. Um, so this, this chart is not in the handout, but what is in the handout <coughs> is this for February. and. And the hand, the hand that is in color, right? Or no, did it come out in black and white? Yeah. Oh. Okay, you may want to circle the reds. <laughs> Although it doesn't matter, this one is done. But these are the change dates on some of these to make the sequence of how they build work better. Okay, so you know the change you already know about from last time is on strategy paper one we made on, uh, on Midnight Sunday. Um, there's another take home that's coming, that's been moved out a week. And then the group project, the POA1, is putting two weeks between POA1 and POA2 instead of one. Uh, and I think that'll make things more successful. Dan? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, on the rubric for the last assignment, the city was due on the 14th. The 14th of? This week. Uh, so for for, for this CIO, one or I, this one? The CIO IP strategy interview. The canvas that was due yesterday, but the rubric that was due on the 14th. Ah, and the reason for that was because some teams reported that they couldn't get the call with their mentor until that date. So I changed it in one and not the other. But um, nobody, and uh, Breed and I had a conversation about that with Breed High. <laughs> um, so nobody's going to get late penalties on that one. So if you've already handed it in and you want to revise it, then you, that's up to you. OK. So this is how the, uh, the plans of action build and the supporting report and slides and the senior management presentation. So this is on the grading tab in the, uh, in the class plan. And that's the date change that happened in the middle. There is a sample plan of action that is out in uh, files miscellaneous. And I have the permission of, uh, of a student um, 
who did this plan and worked on the field of this plan to put that in as an example. It comes from crisis informatics, so it doesn't pertain to the scenarios you're, you're looking at, but it shows how a POA is, uh, is structured well, so you can use it as an example. Yes, you're great. Welcome to this plan of action one, the title says plan of action two. <coughs> right, because it's in two parts. You'll see it when you, when you look at the document. Um, so plan of action one takes you to the senior management presentation. And it has elements that you're going to put in your supporting report, like what's your approach, what's your methodology, you know, things like that, that's in the rubric. Um, and then the, the plan of action two is what you're proposing to the senior management team, which is then has an implementation schedule that goes from the approval date forward. Right? So there's two time horizons for POA1 and POA2. POA1 gets you to the senior management team presentation, POA2 gets you to the, the end of your project, which you're, you're not executing, you're just making a proposal on it. Okay. Um, Molly, next week, oh, next week we have um, uh, a field trip to the UM Data Center. Uh, Breed will be sending around uh, notices about that with bus schedules and, and locations where that is. We'll meet here first because Molly Chang is going to be a guest speaker. So we'll have hear from her first and then we'll get on buses and, and go down to, uh, to the data center. Um, and I need a volunteer to summarize the readings next time.